Welcome to Planning, Management, and Leadership for Health IT, Managing Change. This is Lecture B, Leading Change. In this lecture, we'll be talking about change management and its implications for healthcare IT leaders. The objectives for this unit, Managing Change, are to define change management, Discuss the reasons why change management is important to the success of healthcare IT system implementations. Describe the effects of introducing or changing information technology in a group or organization. And identify elements critical to successful management of change. Under the best of circumstances, a system implementation will never be perfect. The ideal software might have been found which meets the organization's every need, and every clinician wants to be its champion. On paper, it looks great. But, as the implementation is underway, the complaints start coming in. It's not as easy as I thought it would be, or I didn't think the screen would look like this, become common phrases heard in the hallways or the break room. The implementation is not a failure, yet... But one critical element was not addressed, the people who are actually undergoing change. In order to successfully facilitate change, any type of change, the people being asked to change must be considered. Not only does change management require an understanding of each particular organization's culture and structure, an understanding of human behavior is required as well. People can agree on the need for a new system, but that doesn't mean they are receptive to the change of their established routines once that new system arrives. Leading change management also requires an abundance of patience and willingness to listen and learn from others. The role of leadership is crucial in both project failures and project successes. One way of learning how to manage a project or process successfully is to first analyze how it was done poorly or ineffectively. At the very least, this provides a roadmap for how not to execute a project or implementation. One of the root causes for an information system implementation failure is leaving end users out of the decision making or communication process. These oversights can be at any given point in the project from defining the requirements of a new system through planning out the training and go-live schedules. At every opportunity, involve your users. Even if you think you can't communicate the status of the project in any other way, try harder. Find one more way to tell people what is going on with the project and how they can contribute. Part of being successful at change management is repetition of a common message. You cannot communicate enough. Informal opinion leaders can be key assets to the selection or implementation team, especially if they are initially not so gung-ho about the change. Opinion leaders are those individuals who others in the organization respect and who can exert influence on organizational decisions. If they are involved in the process from the start, and feel as if they have a stake in the successful implementation of their system, this could tone down their negativity toward change, and their team members will likely follow suit. Any change will be driven by a leader, so his or her actions and words will be crucial in ensuring success. When putting in a new information system, be it CPOE, or a nursing documentation system, or a new EHR. There will be ample room for action and reaction as the process moves along. In keeping with the you-have-to-see-it-done-badly-to-do-it-well theme, Sherilyn Fuller has outlined three surefire ways to ensure non-acceptance of change. The first step to an implementation failure occurs when the leader fails to communicate the reasons for why a new system was chosen or is being put in place. Or even worse, when the leader announces a unilateral decision to implement a particular system. This is further compounded by the leader's reliance on past experience with the system or vendor, believing that he or she is already experienced with the system and does not need to attend training sessions. 
The team members, on the other hand, have shown up for training and don't see their leader. Most likely, they'll interpret the absence as a snub to the team. It also sends the message that the leader is not part of the team, but is above it somehow. The second step to ensure implementation failure is when the leader ignores ideas and input from the team. If the leader responds, I'll add that to my list, every time a team member makes a suggestion but never writes it down, the team will notice. It won't be long before the team members will keep their questions and suggestions to themselves and silently rubber stamp everything the team leader proposes. Finally, we arrive at step three, in which the leader wisely collects data and user input, but then doesn't analyze it until it's way too late to prevent implementation failure. At this point, it's likely that the team members, probably at the end of their rope, will declare the project dead or a failure. So, how can we avoid failure? Again, sometimes it's easy to see how things shouldn't be done. Whether the failures of a system implementation are real or perceived, once the negative feelings are set in motion, there is very little that can be done to reverse the bad press or negative reactions caused by the change brought about by the new system. In one example, hospital medical residents wore buttons that proclaimed their rejection of the new system. In another, Surgeons insisted that one module of the system be disabled for fear it would provide data for possible malpractice claims, despite their agreement that the use of the information was for improving patient outcomes. Finally, Smelser and colleagues described a very famous system failure at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. The physicians refused to use a very expensive system after deployment causing the organization to cancel the rest of the rollout of the new system. Now let's take a look at what leads to a successful implementation. Fuller describes these steps to help ensure a successful implementation. Step one is to carefully select and properly prepare team members. Key opinion leaders within the organization should be included on the team. Opinion leaders are those people who are able to influence others in the organization, not because they are in authority, but because they are well respected. Explain the reasons why a new system is being selected. Make sure the roles and responsibilities of each team member are clearly defined. This will help ensure that the stakeholders have trust in the process. Encourage team members as well as stakeholders to ask questions, express their opinions, and even challenge assumptions throughout the process. This will increase confidence in the process. The second step of a successful IT implementation is to emphasize training and practice. The leader appreciates feedback and encourages open communications. Because the leader is able to communicate his or her reasons for alterations or changes, the team is able to participate fully in the implementation. Team members feel free to ask questions, make suggestions, and try new approaches to solving problems. In Step 3, the leader uses data to review the implementation and shares that information with the team. There is a lot of listening and discussion between the leader and the team. It's no surprise that these three steps lead to a successful outcome. Now that we have seen the steps involved in implementation failures and successes, let's take a look at a change management framework created by Canada Health InfoWay. This project has outlined a change management framework consisting of six key elements. It includes extensive tools and detailed approaches for all components of the framework. In the next series of slides, we'll look at each of the components of the framework. Governance of the organization and leadership are the pivotal components of the process. The Canada Health InfoWay project defines governance as 
the mechanisms used to guide, steer, or regulate the course of a project. Governance policies would define the committees that are involved, including which stakeholders should be represented, who the leaders are, what the roles of the committees are, and how individual stakeholders can influence both the project itself and the change management activities. It also defines how decisions are made. For instance, if the aim is to add decision support rules to an existing physician order entry system in a hospital, there may be an executive committee who oversees all decisions. The members might include representatives from physicians, nurses, and pharmacists, among others, and there would also be representatives from the IT department. There may be a committee primarily made up of clinical representatives that determines which decision support rules will be added, whether following them is mandatory or optional, etc. If individual physicians want to add a rule or want to argue against a rule, they would go to the clinical committee, who would make a decision on the issue. The overall project structure provides the context for the change management activities. These activities themselves need clarity as to the governance structure. There would be a designated leader, but there might be committees that are responsible for the change management activities for key stakeholders. For instance, there could be a committee or committees whose role would be to oversee the workflow changes, communication, preparation, and training activities for the physicians. You can see that without that governance structure, it would be unclear who is responsible for making decisions, and the project and the change management may have a difficult time going forward. It is the governance structure that can provide the link between strategy, goals, and implementation activities. Without a good governance structure, stakeholders may become disengaged or, even worse, may try to sabotage the efforts. The Canada Health InfoWay describes stakeholder engagement as the process by which the perceptions, issues, and expectations of stakeholders are learned and managed. Understanding stakeholders' needs and addressing them is crucial. There are several forms of getting engagement from stakeholders. These include informing the stakeholder of progress, issues, and successes, consulting and involving the stakeholders in the decision-making process, collaborating with stakeholders for a mutually agreeable outcome, and empowering the stakeholders to execute decisions. All of these forms of engagement are important to the process, and the level of engagement will vary from stage to stage in the process. As has been said in several presentations, good communication is critical to successful implementations. A good communication plan must have a consistent message and should be repeated in many forums. The communication plan should foster open communication, inviting response such as new ideas or potential problems. Without open communication, the value of the project may not be realized and the stakeholders will be unengaged. Creative ideas could be lost and problems not identified and avoided. A critical component of change management and health information systems implementation is a thorough understanding of the work process and information flow as it currently exists to determine if improvement is needed. Again, stakeholder engagement is vital. If the workflow has to change, working with stakeholders will minimize unexpected problems with the new workflow. Any change to the workflow will cause some disruption but if the end users are prepared in advance for the change, and if they were involved in the process, these disruptions will be minimal. If the stakeholders see the potential for process improvement and understand how to use the new technology, then they are more likely to embrace the new system and consider it a valuable asset rather than a cumbersome waste of time. Training on the new system can prepare users for the change in routine, as well as teach them the basics of using the system. Users of the new system need time away from their regular work responsibilities to properly learn the software and to respond to the changes in workflow. 
shifts might need to be adjusted so that clinicians do not have to keep up with their daily patient load while learning the new system. A trend in many implementations is to have some classroom training beforehand, then to have ample super users during go live to support the clinicians in adjusting to and learning the new system in their actual environment while delivering patient care. It is equally important to include training in personal management of change and stress related to work changes, in addition to the technical training. Oftentimes, end users of new systems just want their voices to be heard. Holding frequent and widely publicized forums, whereby progress and issues can be reported, can go a long way in alleviating the stress of individuals undergoing change. It is a good idea during any implementation, large or small, to periodically pause and evaluate how things are going. No matter how thoroughly one plans, all the risks and interdependencies cannot be identified at the onset of an implementation. Personnel changes, hardware upgrades or outages, and regulatory changes are only some of the risks that cannot be planned for ahead of time. Likewise, there might be processes that were established at the beginning of the project that are no longer efficient or necessary. If proper monitoring is taking place, these can be identified and adjusted. The conclusion of each phase or a rollout of a system implementation should include a formal evaluation. Survey the team members, stakeholders, and end users to identify what worked and what didn't. Then be sure to adjust the process for the next phase. Don't forget to acknowledge when things go well. Even small successes should be recognized and celebrated. Remember that the change leader's role is to facilitate the project moving forward, but the leader cannot force individuals to comply with his or her wishes. Action relies on agreements, accountability, process, incentives, recognizing needs, and having authority. There are, however, some things that you can do. We have already said that having a champion and executive buy-in are needed. It is also important to have organizational opinion leaders included in the decision-making process. It is important to have them feel a part of the process, even if they are not actually on the implementation team. Goals and methods need to be realistic and tailored to the needs of the situation. The leader should be alert to problems and try to remove barriers to the team's success. As we have said, communication is key. So, make sure you have the channels to both send effective communication and receive it. Leaders will use their position to influence priorities keeping the overall goal in mind. And finally, bear in mind that the leader will be held accountable for the results. It is in the leader's best interest to have good ways to measure results, both to document successes and to identify areas for improvement. Following these principles may not ensure a totally smooth change process, but they will do much to make the road less bumpy. This concludes Managing Change. In summary, we discuss definitions of change management, different frameworks for change management, and key leadership approaches to preparing an organization for change. We then looked at steps which result in failed implementations and contrasted them with steps which result in successful implementations.